Good morning. morning. It's so good to be here this morning, and I really mean that. I was up most of the night still dealing with this pain in this evacuated tooth out of there, and uh, it was a lot of pain. Its sugars were out of whack. What in the world? So I'd appreciate your prayers this morning. We're going to be looking at a lot of scripture and looking at some of the wiles and snares of the devil in the life of Samson, the Corinthian church, and how it all relates to where we are today. If you'll turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 11, we're going to start there and eventually get to Judges 13. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, I come humbly before you this morning. And oh, how I give thanks to you, Lord, for thy salvation. Thank you. And I ask for your wisdom to teach this lesson. I need you, Father. You know I can't do anything in my own strength or wisdom. So I'm trusting you to help me get across what you want to say to these dear people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to thank everyone first for praying for me. For those that don't know... I had a painful wisdom tooth removed, extracted, and root and all, and the oral surgeon said there were cracks in the root. So he didn't have to just pull it. He had to drill it all out, get all those pieces out. So uh, I've been dealing with the pain of all that and for the last week or so on pain meds, even right now, and uh, heat and pads and such. I may have gotten a dry socket or a bone spur. I don't know. It didn't, just didn't seem to want to let go. And, but I know things are going to get better, praise the Lord. And uh, it got me to looking at all that. Did you know that the root of a tooth is its foundation? Uh, the root helps to hold the tooth in place, and it protects it from damage. If a root becomes cracked or anything, it can lead to decay and eventually the loss of the tooth. But if, the fact is, is the root functions as an anchor for the tooth and it has a lot of it's a, has a complex passage of blood and and nerve it's for supply and maintain health of that tooth and all that got to me to thinking about David lamenting in Psalm 11 look there with me just as an introduction here to what we're going to be looking at this morning he said in verse 3 of Psalm 11 if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do and in verse 2, he said, For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily, in other words, in the darkness, shoot at the upright in heart. David had a determined in his heart, mind, soul to trust in God. He said, In the Lord I put my trust. How say ye to my soul? Flee as a bird to your mountain. Listen, David had his troubles. He was hunted by King Saul who was jealous of him and he had a rage and resentment toward David that just took over. And David was a popular man in the land and he had killed Goliath of Gath and the people sang his praises above Saul. I mean, David could have easily organized a, a revolt against the throne of King Saul, but he didn't. Some of the people even urged him, go on, flee to the mountains and... And, and, but he didn't do either one because he was controlled by his trust in God. David knew all about the whisperers that were there, the, the backbiters and all the social climbers in, in Saul's court. They shot their poisonous, barbed insinuations and lies into the ears and whispered them into King Saul. And it was all aimed at destroying David. And so David cried, if the foundations be destroyed... Who, what can the righteous do? The word foundations comes from a Hebrew word meaning the settled order of things. David was comparing society to a building. The foundation of society is law and order and, and justice and truth. And if law and order, justice and truth are undermined in a society, what can the righteous do? They're, the very foundations have been and are being destroyed in this country and around the world right now. Law, order, truth, justice, morality, decency, integrity. A determined attack is being mounted about, uh, toward everything that's decent, moral, and Christian. 
in our society. The foundations are being destroyed to make room for the coming of the man of sin, the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work 24-7. You know Satan's plan and desire is to make the church, the people of God, ineffective, to shut you up. And since he couldn't stop God's plan at the cross or the resurrection, his alternate plan has been to have the power of God, which is most clearly understood in the preaching of the cross and the offer of salvation to anybody who believes by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on that cross and arose from the dead on the third day, the very one who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The devil's wanting all of that, all that, anything having to do with that, to just fade into the background. He's using everything in his arsenal against you to make sure that happens. The devil is at work. How does he do it? He does it by trying to put hindrances, blockages, detours, and snares into the path of every born-again saved believer so that we'll take our eyes off Christ. He uses the snares of debate. He uses snares of division, doubt, and deception. He wants to hamstring us, to take us off the right road onto the wrong road, to make us ineffective in our witness and make us sure that we're living a monotonous, powerless, humdrum life where our labor for the Lord has no power. Why? Well, why do you think that? Well, he's got a plan. It's so that you won't be a threat to what he's building in this world today because he hates God and his creation. So he's at work, and we're seeing it come to pass like never before. Now, Paul knew biblical history, the apostle did, and he was familiar with the patterns and plans of the devil. After all, he was Paul. Paul who wrote 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul knew the scripture. He knew about Genesis 3, how Eve was deceived and Adam was disobedient. Paul knew of the subtlety of the devil's lies and deceptions and all his snares and traps that he sets out for believers to fall into. He knew all about the wiles of the devil. That's why he told us in Ephesians 6.11, you know that verse, put on the whole armor of God, not parts of it, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, oh, they had their problems, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. The devil, when he wants to destroy us and destroy you, he starts by deceiving you, by working on your mind. And then he works on the rest of you because you see, the thought is the father of the deed. He'd rather get you to believe a wrong thing than to do a wrong thing. First, why? Because if he gets you to believing the wrong thing, I guarantee you, before you know it, you're going to be doing the wrong thing. The thought is the father of the deed. You sow a thought, you reap a deed. You sow a deed, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. It all begins with a thought life. The devil wants you to question God. Yea, yea, hath God said? Hmm. Listen, if the devil can get you to think negatively about God, he's got you. He wants you to think coldly and harshly about God. He wants you to think cynically and distrustfully about God. He puts a snare in your path to question and doubt the truth of God's word. He'll whisper and tell you, you can't believe the Bible or all those promises that God made. The word of God just can't be trusted. Listen, truth is always changing, he'll say. That's relativism. Folks, he'll say, truth, it's just what you experience. There's nothing absolute in it, not a thing. Or he'll say, it's just all subjective. What's true for you isn't true for me. Or he'll rationalize it and say, just think about it logically. It's all relative anyway. The devil substitutes truth that says, Thus saith the word of God. For his truth 
Thus saith the word of man. Not just the word of man, but the mind of man. Satan wants to get you to think God is unfair. So he'll send snares of temptation that question God. Excuse me. And he get, wants to get you to thinking, why can't we eat of that tree? What's wrong with it? Why can't my eyes be opened and I can just be as God's? That's pretty good. Why can't I eat of that fruit? Hmm. And the devil, next thing you know, you're making judgments about the fairness of God. Oh, golly, God just doesn't want me to reach my full potential. Why do I need God to tell me what's right and wrong? I can be independent and I can be liberated. The devil whispers, he's just trying to keep you from knowing the things he knows. On and on it goes. All these things are lies from the devil. His snares are all over the place as you walk in your Christian life. Satan's going to try to get you to doubt what God has said in his word. And he'll use the wisdom of men to do it. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, Paul couldn't have been more clear. He wanted them to know that his speech, his preaching, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with demonstration of the spirit and power. Why? Because he wanted them to know that, that their faith shouldn't stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's what Paul told them. He knew about the power of God. Paul did because he had Christ. And he wanted every one of us to know it too. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 1.18. The scripture says this. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by, the wisdom, by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And in verse 24 he said, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see that? It's Christ. Listen, God's power is available when we surrender to God by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. You think Satan doesn't know that? Sure he knows that. The devil knows that we have the power of God at our disposal. You do and I do. It's fact. In fact, Satan lives in fear of the day when somebody realizes that and gets off the dead sinner out of their complacency. The devil knows what can happen to his kingdom in this God-forsaken world. For example, you remember D.L. Moody, that great preacher and saint of God, when he was a boy, a youth, prankster. He could barely read or write. He comes to Christ through a Sunday school teacher. And Moody made his life-changing decision to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and give his all to the service of the Lord. Well, thousands of people in the years after Moody's conversion and came to Christ would have their lives completely changed through the gospel message of this bumbling, stumbling preacher. He could hardly pronounce the word Jerusalem, but the power of God flowed through him. Satan is known from the beginning of time. He's got to do something to hold and keep the people of God captive, to make them powerless, to keep you on dead center, ineffective, going round and round, going nowhere. And so what does he do? Well, he goes after the things that he knows are going to make believers weak as other men if they yield to it. Let's look at that. Turn to the book of Judges. Judges 13, chapter 13. We're going to see the devil's strategy. It's about Samson. He was a mighty anointed man of God. He was called to bring deliverance to the people of Israel. And we see here that verse 5 of chapter 13, the angel of God initially appearing to Samson's mama. For lo, 
Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Samson was set apart to God from birth. Throughout the story of Samson, at least three times in Judges 14 and 15, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Listen, the Bible wouldn't say that if it wasn't so. He was given mighty physical strength and power from God above that came straight from God. Yet despite the incredible call on his life and demonstrate of God's power, he experienced time and again, time and again, Samson eventually, eventually allowed himself to be seduced. We know that story and we're going to look at it. Hold your place in Judges. Look back at Proverbs. Look up toward Proverbs 5, 7. Because this shows us the spiritual condition that Samson gave into. Proverbs 5, 7. Hear me now, therefore, O children, O ye children, depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor to others, and thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, thy labors be in the house of a stranger. Now while the her in this passage rever refers to the significance seductive spirit of Jezebel woman I ask you could that be a seductive religion now I'm not trying to read into this but I, the truth of the matter this anything I mean anything I don't care what it is that gets your eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ and tries to turn you away from him his way his truth his life he is the way the truth and the life then it's a lie it's a seduction it's that seductive spirit it's running rampant in our country in this world today. In Samson's case, her name was Delilah, and he fell in love with her. Now, Samson was anointed, great strength. He couldn't be held with any form of cord that this world could produce. And we know Delilah worked hard at trying to discover what was the source of that. And she could, if she could, she could tell the Philistines, and they'd give her silver for it. In Judges 16, 6, and Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Listen, Samson knew his source. He knew that he was set apart to God for honor, God's honor, God's glory, from the moment of his birth. Nevertheless, he began to play this dangerous game with Delilah. And he said to her in verse 7, If they bind me with seven green withs that were never dried, then I shall be weak, and as other men now, Samson had a knowledge that he couldn't be bound by any new devices, no ropes, no cords, no anything. For us, that means any new battles, new trials, new strategies that you've never faced before. Today, the devil's going to try to tell you that he's got you bound. That's right. That's one of his snares. He'll come against you with a battle and try to tell you that you're not going to get through it. You're not going to get through it. Folks, we're facing spiritual battles like never before. All of you are. I know it. And, and I've never seen anything like it. But the thing is, you know, I know that Christ has already triumphed. Has he not? Yes. He's broken all the cords of sin. He's broken every power of hell. Let me say this. There's no new struggle, no new battle that can bind you or take away the strength of God in you. Oh, Satan can weaken you for sure. Yep. If you've fallen for the wiles of the devil and fallen into one of his snares. But listen, when we were born again, saved by the power of God, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who wants to guide our every step, every decision. But when we're not listening to the Lord or walking in his way and we're not in the word of God, things can happen, right? Yeah, they can. The seven bowstrings didn't keep Samson bound, so Delilah persisted. She kept at it, asking him about the source of his strength. Look what he said in verse 11. If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as other man. What's going on here? Well, Samson was being led down a path with the devil's snares, landmines all around, playing a dangerous game, proving, you know, he was trying to prove, hey, all this stuff is not going to work. 
But in verse 13, Delilah asked him a third time. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. Here we go again. The Philistines could try to tie his head down. But Samson knew that wouldn't work. This touches on the fact that we as believers, as I mentioned earlier, that the devil's going to try to bring, bring defeat into our mind. That's where the arguments come from. That's where the devil would try to tie us down. But as we saturate our heart and our mind with the word of God as we, and we know our identity is in Christ, we won't be defeated. We know the victory's been won. What does the Bible say in Philippians 4.13? It says, I can do all things through my own striving, my skills, my wisdom, my mind, trying to finagle and finagle and figure things out. No, that's not what it says. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That's why Paul said, therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The scripture is clear when Paul says in Romans 12, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you preach your bodies, present them as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And Paul told the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And in Romans 8, 5, he said, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The devil knows that. He knows that, folks. He's, he's coming after you. And while he knows he can't take your soul when you've been born again, he wants to hurt your witness and bring you down and bring doubts and confusion, traps and snares along the way in our Christian life to make us ineffective for the cause of Christ. But so Delilah kept pressing Samson, pushing him, seducing him with her words, her whispers, her urgings, her vexing and lying to him until she, he finally gave in and divulged the truth. In chapter 16, verse 17 of Judges, he said that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become as weak and be like other men. Here's what the devil was after all along. Was, and Samson revealed it to her. This seductive spirit in the form of Delilah. In other words, he told her, if, I be, if my being sanctified to God for the purpose of freeing others from bondage and oppression is willfully and unwittingly forfeited, that I'll become as weak as other men. Again, did Samson believe God? Yes, sure he did. He knew he'd been called, anointed by the Lord to be and to do God for God's honor and glory. But we can see he got off the, the right path, didn't he? He did. He got onto the wrong path and he fell into a snare of the devil, thinking he could manage it until finally he gave in, didn't he? And it cost him. It cost him. That's exactly what happened to him. Now this is important. When we as believers forget who we are in Christ, that our identity is in Christ alone, and we get distracted and fall into one of the devil's snares and all the things in this world. In other words, we get our eyes off the Lord Jesus and we begin to let the pride of self get in the way of God's purpose. And we forget the strength that we have comes from the Lord God. And we think we can do things in our own power and strength without the power of God. We can do things in our own mental ability, our own doing, our own skills without the power of God and his direction and guidance from the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, when we start using the gifts that God has given to us for ourselves, 
you can be certain. You can be dead certain. You're going to fall for the subtle lies of evil, of all sorts of conniving and loose doctrines of devils. And that's what's going on all around us. You'll have to do that before you know it. And the power of God in your life is going to dry up. I started thinking about how this was played out, sadly, in the name Ichabod. It's found in two places in the Bible, in 1 Samuel 4.21 and 14.3. You don't have to turn there, but let me just give you a quick rundown. Ichabod was a son of Phinehas, the grandson of Eli, who was the priest of the Lord in Shiloh. And this sad story of Eli and his two wayward sons, Phinehas and Hophni, is found in 1 Samuel chapters 2 and 4. And Hophni and Phinehas died in battle with the Philistines who had captured the Ark of the Covenant and took it away from Israel. And when Eli heard of this terrible news, you know the story, he fell backward off his chair and broke his neck and he died. Now Phineas's pregnant wife went into labor and she had a son. That son was Ichabod. She named him in 1 Samuel 4, verse 21, he said, And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. The word Ichabod means literally inglorious. There is no glory. The glory has departed and in her pain and despair, the woman, the scripture doesn't give us her name, grieved over the loss of God from Israel. The glory of God is used to describe God's favor and blessings toward the people. In the Old Testament, God's glory is seen as a pillar of fire, a cloud that followed the Israelites during their exodus journey from Egypt, guiding and guarding them. Once the Ark of the Covenant was built and placed in the tabernacle in the wilderness, and later in the temple in Jerusalem, God's glory resided there as a symbol of his presence among his people. And when the ark was captured by the Philistines, the glory departed from Israel, and Ichabod became a reality. Jesus referred to the glory of God leaving Israel in the last message he gave to the people of Israel in Matthew 23, 37, his final word to the religious leaders. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. This was his final statement of judgment on Israel for her rejection of the Messiah. He indicted their leaders. And by indicting them, he indicted everybody that followed them. And now he says their house was left desolate. desolate. In other words, Ichabod, the glory's departed from you. You see that? He, he says your house is left, your house is left desolate. Not my house. My father's house, he's, he used to call it. Now it's your house because God's left. Ichabod, no longer there. It's not the father's house, not my house. It's your house. The Greek word translated desolate means abandoned or ruin. In other words, this place is an abandonment to God. God has left its curse, devoted to ruination, and they won't see Jesus again till he comes in glory. We read about that in Matthew 23. Listen, it's a terrible thing, terrible thing, to experience the loss of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And yes, while it, Israel's ruin, it was temporary until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, as Paul tells us in Romans 11. You wonder how many churches today, right now, that are teaching Sunday school or preaching, going through the motions of a Sunday school or preaching, and these, it's just a ritual. There's nothing there. There's, there's no power or strength. They're carrying on without the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit of God, whether willingly or unknowingly. It's a false spirit going around in their midst. Same thing that caused Ichabod in Israel. What things? What things? Well, sin, disobedience, idolatry. It's going on all over the place in churches in this country and all over the world. Apostasy is it's running wild. 
snares of the devil. But I, I agree with our preacher. Praise be to God. The presence of the Holy Ghost was in this place last Sunday morning. I wasn't here. I was at home dealing with this pain and swollen jaw. But I watched and I felt the saw the power of God and the Holy Ghost in this place. Listen, God is sovereign. The Holy Ghost comes and goes where he wills. And he lifts up and gives glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and gives honor to him. John 3, 8 the Lord Jesus said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell whence it come. And whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. May God help us never, never to take for granted the presence of the Holy Ghost in our lives and the glory of God in our midst. Lest we wake up one day and find that Ichabod has become a reality among us. The Apostle Paul fought hard. He fought hard to remind the Christian believers of who they were in Christ. Their sanctification to God. And their walk daily with Him to serve Him. But a lot of them refused. He told them in 1 Corinthians six nineteen. You know that. What? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which you have of God? And ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Were they saved? Yeah, they were saved. But Paul was trying to remind them of who they were in Christ and stop listening to the whispers of the flesh of that old man and falling for the snares of the devil who was pushing them along to believe his lies, saying it won't make any difference. Yes, it does. It does make a difference in your peace and your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul reminded them in verse 11, And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Ezekiel thirty-three, thirty-two says, And lo, thou art with them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words but they do them not. Hmm. In other words, as long as we know where the truth is, we can go out and play our games for another week or two and live for ourselves and not walk in the Spirit. It'll be okay. Do you hear that? That's delusional thinking. That's crazy thinking. That's the evil one. It reminds me of a song I heard years ago by a blind, blind fella, totally blind. He said, don't play the game. Talented Christian songwriter. He said, don't play the game. Pretending you're a Christian is something you can't afford. Maybe you can fool the people of the church, but you just can't fool the Lord. You know he knows everything you do. He knows just how, how you feel. Cut the act and state the fact. Why don't you be for real? I know you speak the language. I know you sing the songs. You've been playing Holy Joe with Jesus much too long. Cut the great pretension. Don't try to be star. Get down off that stage now and become what you say you are. Way down deep inside yourself, you hate the games you play. You've been getting more involved with every prayer you pray. Let it go no longer. Let this new thing start. Give yourself to Jesus and let him change your heart. Don't play the game. Don't play the game. You just can't do it. Don't play the game. He'll see right through it. Don't play the game. You just can't do it. You've got to make a brand new start. Give him your heart. People are going along saying it's all going to be okay. If things really get tough, we know where to find the truth. We know where we can come back to. We know how to get it right someday. But in the meantime, let's go out and forget, forget about our being bought with a price because there's just so many things to do in this world. I mean, I'm lured. I can't help it. People to see and just doing for a little while. We want to do what I want to do for a little while in this world. It really won't hurt anything. Well, those are lies and snares from the devil. And that's the game Sansom played. And ultimately it cost him, I said, Judge 16 tells us, And when Delilah saw that he had told all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought money in her hand, made him sleep under her knees, and she called for a man and called him to shave off his seven locks of head. She began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Samson's a snapshot of spiritual blindness, folks. Labors and works that profit nothing. And at this point in his life, Satan had him right where he wanted him. You say, well, what's the enemy after? That devil and those who do his bidding. 
this God-forsaken world, listen to me, they're going after your life. And he wants to rob you of your peace with God. He doesn't care how he does it, just so he cripples your testimony and your walk with God, maybe your very life, just to get you out of the way. He doesn't want us listening and believing what God says in his word. He doesn't want us to be a witness for him, standing strong and contending for the faith. No. He wants to weaken our faith and bring doubts about God's word and who God is. And he wants to just accept things as they are. He says, so what? So what if there are umpteen thousand perversions of the Bible? Just pick one that feels good to you. Isn't that what he says? Sure. That's what people are doing. Go with the flow and don't rock the boat. Forget about God's word in the King James Bible. Forget about that. Just keep plodding along. And definitely don't open your mouth about the Lord Jesus. Shh. Just keep plodding along and grinding in that prison house, thinking that everything's okay. And what we're doing is just fine, and it's enough. We'll just leave it at that. Well, to a large extent, the devil succeeded, hadn't he? That's why we're in a weak and emaciated Laodicean church age. No wonder people can pass by the doors of a church today in this world and not even give a second thought what's going on inside. They recognize the value system in a lot of churches is the same that's going on outside. There's nothing in church that confronts ungodliness or surrounding society. And so Satan's work trying to slow down our commitment to the Lord God. He's always going to send some form of seductive, enticing religion or some feel-good messages to tempt us with imaginations of your mind. When you get home today, read Revelation 3 about the church and lay out a sea. You get a clear picture of where we are today. Open your eyes. All of it, all of it in this world, the devil promises to give you what you want and give you relief and take care of you. Just sit back, relax, and follow the lockstep. Go right on and do what they tell you, but they don't realize that the Lord God Almighty is in control of all this. He's in control of the timetable. So what do we do when the foundations be destroyed? We stand strong in faith. Continue to boldly proclaim and share the gospel truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, as long as we have life and breath. But no, no, they don't want that. The world doesn't want to hear about it. The truth, the true light, the Lord Jesus, because they're interested only in the counterfeit light, the God of their own making. Satan's in the business, folks, of seduction. Remember, he's dressed as a wolf in sheep's clothing. The Lord Jesus was clear. He said he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. So Delilah comes to Samson, pleading with him until his soul was so vexed. What amazes me, it wasn't even hidden. It's just out there, clear as it can be. How many of us have ever said, just one more, one more time, or just, I'll start tomorrow? The seductive spirit is coming after us, and we can see all around in this world what's going on. It's going after the source of life and of Christ in us. And I encourage you to read Proverbs 7 later on. Proverbs 7 is a, is a picture of what's happening. And it's all over television and our schools, our culture and religions, all over this world, everywhere you turn. Let's do what feels good. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? Again, the world's philosophy says it feels good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it. It's, I'm okay. You're okay. No matter what it costs or the consequences, forget about that. Just do as thy wilt. It's prompted by that godless Luciferian Alice Crowley, Blavatsky, and Alice Bailey with their ten-point plan to destroy Christianity. That's a snare of the devil. It's a seductive spirit. Listen, there are Christians all around, folks, that may be intelligent, well-meaning, that ought to be strong and mighty in God and the truth of his word, but instead they've been blinded by the seductive spirit that promotes it's all about me. Just love yourself. Live your best life now. That's what the devil wants. All oh, lies, lies, hogwash. Listening and binding into that lies a snare from the devil. It's contrary to the word of God. 
and that which is found in Christ. God doesn't want us going around and around in a prison house, which is what happened to Samson. He wants us to use every one of us for his glory. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ, for the Lord Jesus, and to live in the power of the Holy Spirit by his grace and contend for the faith, not giving in to the deceptions and snares of the devil. The sad truth is a lot of folks don't have any discernment, no discernment, because they walked into a house of spiritual harlot. Now they're comfortable, feeling good about themselves and focused on themselves. God help us. This is exactly what was going on in the church of Corinth. Paul was trying to get them to see what was at stake. Thank God it, that doesn't have to be the end of the story. Amen. Mm. Samson's eyes were gouged out. The story goes on. And he was confined to the prison house. But the hairs of his head started growing again. The devil in the meantime was having a big party over his head. Joined the triumph and victory. And Satan was pulling together all the hordes of the Philistines. And 3,000 others of the same spirit of darkness. While they worshipped their false god Dagon. And the devil was laughing over the balcony. He pulled down and laughed at Samson, who was supposed to be the deliverer with the anointing of God to bring God's people out of captivity. You read about that in Judges 16, 24. So it looks like Samson was reaping what he had sowed, but we know the story's not over. In verse 26, we read, When blind Samson came into the house... He said to the boy that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I can feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. There were two pillars held there that held the house up. I believe that the worship of the false and mockery of the true. That's what it was. And as the 3,000 Philistines on the roof praised their false god who delivered Samson into their hands, Samson called out to the Lord one more time. Let me die with the Philistines. I believe Samson had grown tired of that mockery. Sacrificed his life in order the power of God to be revealed through him one more time. I believe there are true Bible-believing Christians here and throughout the world, especially in persecuted countries, who are doing the same thing as Samson. They're standing up to the wiles of the devil by putting the whole armor of God on them. Not in their strength, but in the power of God. You ask, well, where's the power of God lie? It's in Christ. In Christ. It's Christ in you. As we surrender and submit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ alone, to his purpose, that's where the power of the Holy Spirit is found, where the glory of God is known. Paul said in Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, here it is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? And so when Samson finally refocused and he grabbed a hold of the of the truth, of his true source of power, getting his eyes off himself and back onto the Lord God, the one that had called him. He called out to God. What's that? He prayed. He prayed. He finally humbled himself and asked God to enable to bring down those pillars and destroy what had been given over to Satan. No more walking around in defeat in a prison house in his own power and strength. No, no. No more walking around without spiritual vision. Even though he was blind, he could finally see. Praise be to God. And I pray God's amazing grace is a reality to you. The question is that each of us need to be asking ourselves is this. In these last days, are we walking? Am I walking as a Bible-believing Christian in the fullness and power of the Holy Ghost? Or he truly able to say, I was blind, but now I see. I know Christian people who've been on that train of deceit and blindness, and now they're having a hunger for the truth of God in their lives. They're wondering how they might have peace and power of God in lives again that you've got. They're watching. It's by getting alone with God, praying, crying out to God with a humble heart of confession and repentance, saying, Lord, I've messed up. I got off track here. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us 
from all unrighteous. Listen, people are watching as things spiral further and further down, out of control in this world. They want to see something different in your life and mine than the world has to offer. They're wanting what you've got. I believe there are those that are still wanting the truth, and that truth is a person. We know it's been preached from this pulpit and taught here time after time. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. He's the truth, the righteous one. He knows and sees exactly what's going on. And there are people who are turning back to the Lord, wanting to make their calling and election sure, wanting to be obedient and walk in God's way and set apart from the rest of this world. And we all need to be ready to help them with the answer. Peter said it, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Well, after Samson's fall, he laid hold of God. one last surge of power, demonstration that he could be faithful even unto death. I believe the Bible shows us the moment he pulled down those pillars, he died to himself. And he lived for the honor and purpose of God. What a lesson for us to learn. That's what we as believers got to do. We got to realize there's power of God where it really is. It's not found in any of us who live for ourselves. No. But it's in those who die to themselves and desire, above, desire God above all earthly ties and joys. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said in Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. Your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. Christ's life in you. And it's possible hell may be having a party over your head right now. He has mine from time to time. The devil may be laughing, trying to bind you up with battles, new ones, bringing back old struggles or bringing assaults and accusations against you for past sins and defeats and failures. Remember, he's the accuser of the brethren, isn't he? Well, let me tell you, just as it was with Samson, it's time for you to cancel that party. It is. Scripture says he was a man of faith. At the same time, we see he was a man of the flesh. He had many sins. The Bible tells us it's what he says. The Bible's true. He had fallen to the snares of the devil, and that should serve as a warning to any of us who would listen to the devil's lies and play with fire and expect not to get burned. The life of Samson, Corinthian church, is a testimony, I'm sure, of every single one of us in here. Shows the importance of relying on God's strength, not our own power, and listening to the Holy Spirit's leading and following God's will, not our own stubbornness, seeking the Lord's wisdom, not our own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. There are many snares, folks, as we come to a close. We desperately need discernment, and that, that's another lesson altogether. But we need to be praying and asking God for discernment in these last days, this last hour, to recognize these snares and the wiles of the devil so we won't be deceived and we'll be alert and watchful all along the way, knowing that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And all the while, all the while, we're looking, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So how's your foundation this morning? I pray you're trusting in that solid rock, that sure foundation that has no cracks, but is solid and sure, anchor that holds when the strong winds blow and the devil and his minions come knocking at your door with their seductive, words and lies, you could say my house is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word this morning.
I pray it goes forth and that it won't turn void, it won't return void, but it'll accomplish that which you please. I pray we each can apply this into our lives, that we might be aware of the devil's snares and that we can walk in victory in whatever situation we find ourselves in as we look now, now Father, to your coming. I pray for the upcoming service. Lord Jesus is uplifted and glorified in this service and everything that's done in the songs that's sung, prayers prayed, and the preaching, give our preacher unction, Father, as he preaches the word. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.